Okay. Okay, I'm going to take the opportunity to say hello to everyone and to thank everyone who chose to join us today. I want to introduce Rabbi Natasha Mann. Rabbi Natasha is a rabbi at uh, New London Synagogue and is a graduate of uh, Ziegler uh, Rabbinical School, and she's going to be our host for today. I'm, uh, I'm uh, in Berlin uh, today for the ordination, and uh, it's a big pleasure for me to welcome all of you to share together with you uh, uh, the opportunity to meet with some of the leading uh, thinkers and speakers in the movement on the question of training rabbis and of rabbis in communities. And it's a very special day for us. But I'm not going to speak anymore. And I'm passing on to my friend and to my colleague, uh, Rabbi Natasha. Thank you, Rabbi Chaim. Um, so lovely to be here for this Berlin Learning Day, which is in fact taking place all across the world rather than simply in Berlin. Um, I want to just take a moment to say a couple more things about myself, because I think that uh, the, the reason that I understand that Rabbi Chaim asked me to do a little bit of emceeing today is because I'm a recent rabbi. I've been a rabbi now for a year and a half, um, half of that time, you know, I have no idea how much of that time anymore has been spent during this, uh, this strange crisis that we're in. Um, and those of you who are listening to me in English can hear that I have an English accent. I am, in fact, English born and bred. But I did my studying in America always with the plan to come back to England. And in fact, I serve as a rabbi in the same synagogue that I, um, that I learned in when I was young. I was a teenager when I became a congregant at New London Synagogue, um, went away to rabbinical school and uh, came back to be uh, one of the rabbis at the synagogue. And I also work for a very small community called Mosaic Masorti. So I get to see all kinds of different communities and how they work in the UK. Um, and so I've seen, I think, quite a bit of the world from a Jewish perspective, from a learning perspective. So it's really exciting to be able to be here learning about the rabbinate and the world today. I want to do just a little bit of housekeeping before we get into this incredible panel that we have set up. Um, first of all, I will be taking questions through the chat. If you have questions along the way for our um, for our guests, um, or for me, but probably for our much more interesting speakers, uh, please do put them in the chat. Tahila will be collecting them, putting them together for me, and we will try and find as much time as possible to respond to those questions. And also, if you have technical questions, Tahila is the person to ask those questions to. Uh, there is a translation option. Perhaps you're hearing me over the translation option. Thank you very much to the people who are hard at work doing the translating. Um, if you are unsure where to find this, it'll be at the bottom of your screen. There will be an interpretation option. And if you're having trouble, please do message to Hila. I want to take no more of this time because what we have right now is a very, very rare and special experience in that we have four of the heads of the, um, of the rabbinical schools across the world here today. Um, and they are usually not able to be in the same room. So being able to do it this way is um, really, really special. We're gonna hear over this next hour from Rabbi Bradley Artson, who's the head of the Ziegler Rabbinical School in Los Angeles and also the Frankel College in Berlin and was my, uh, was the Dean at, the, at Ziegler while I was there too, is a good uh, friend and teacher of mine. We're gonna hear from Rabbi Avi Novis Deutsch from the Schechter Rabbinical School in Jerusalem, hmm. Rabbi Ariel Stoffenmacher from the Seminario Rabbinico in Buenos Aires, and Rabbi Gordon Tucker from the Jewish Theological Seminary in New York. That is a real star team. We'll take a 15 minute break after that section. And when we come back afterwards, we'll hear, um, we'll hear from Rabbi Cheryl Peretz and from Matt Plen. Um, 
here's the question that we want this all-star team to be addressing. Question is this, um, it's about the, the future and the present. So what are our communities going to look like in 10 years time and in 20 years time, if you can take a guess at that, and how do we train rabbis today to meet the challenges of tomorrow? I'm going to ask each, um, each of the heads of the school to respond to this question by themselves for, uh, for something like 10 minutes. Um, I will come up between each of them and attempt to do a little bit of summarizing and putting this together. And then at the end, I'll take some of the questions. We'll see how much, how much time we have at the end for questions. Hopefully there will be some. I'm going to repeat that question. So the question was, what will our communities look like in 10 years and in 20 years from today? And how do we train rabbis today to meet the challenges of tomorrow? I'm going to ask Rabbi, Rabbi Avi Novostoich to start us off on that, the head of the Shechta Rabbinical School in Jerusalem. Please. Thank you, Rabbi. And... Um... Thank you everyone for coming and it's really, really exciting. And I think in a way I want to start with an example that is a, an outcome of COVID maybe, but it's actually, I think, part of the future in general. Um, so uh, today we started uh, our rabbinical school year and we had a student from uh, Vienne joining us and uh, we'll be training him First, while he's in Vienna, at this, and hopefully at a certain point while, he, while in, he's in Israel. We also had a student from Argentina, and and we'll, tomorrow we're starting our master's program, and we'll have a student from France, Serbia, Netherlands, and uh, uh, France, and other places. And I, I mention that because I think that when we think of the congregations of the future, we, and we all also, when we think about the, the coming generation and their relation to identity, we need to understand um, that in a way we're talking about a sense of belonging to more than one identity and to more than one congregation. And, and, they, and that many of the congregation will be mainly virtual, digital, and not necessarily in person, or it, they'll have a, a vast, a huge part of them that is happening in uh, in virtual uh, tools and not necessarily by in-person encounters, at least what we used to call in-person encounters, the physical encounters. So I think one point that to me seems to be more and more clear is the issue of many people belonging to more than one congregation and people using the fact that we can connect via um, the web to people all around the world to create different connections and new connections. The other thing that I think, um, actually I think when uh, a similar group had the discussion, uh, similar discussion, I think it was in, uh, it was in Canada, right? In, uh, so Canada. is that um, the affiliation bit is changing. I think that our student body and definitely our congregants are less into full affiliation with something specific. And it means that we need to be more about uh, meeting the needs and creating a relationship via needs and via specific programming and less a connection that is based on, uh, on membership in a way and denomination and affiliation sort of thing. But we really, we will need to work harder in a way in terms of the connection. And lots of the connection will have to do uh, with really the personal relationship. And that's, that's a weird thing about this situation, that on one hand, people can belong to many, many places. But if, again, if we reevaluate what COVID create, uh, brings to us and kind of the message that COVID is telling us, that people still need a sense of belonging and a sense of caring. And the people who will be able to offer care uh, rabbis and leaders and congregational leaders and congregants will be able to really create a community of care, of relationships that are about 
really being there for another person, I think they'll strive and they'll create something that is meaningful and in the long term, something that will, will be very beneficial. Um, the other very basic thing that we need to understand is that we're, uh, we're training rabbis to the age of information. There's all the information that they have access to or the congregants have access to. And it's really about, and I think our role and my graduate's role is more like an, as enablers, as facilitators, as people would enable congregants to meet this information and to be able to really um, touch it and feel it and be part of it. And I'm really hopeful and I think this is part of the challenge, but also the opportunity for the future of Masori is that we'll de develop much more um, well immersed, well trained uh, congregants, people, congregants who can actually are less dependent on rabbis, are less dependent on leadership, and are more able to to sustain a congregation by themselves. And then the role of the rabbi is more an add on, it's more an enrichment role, it's more an <laughs> be the professional that is getting paid to sing 24 7 about the congregation and less be the one who meets his specific needs. So I'm not sure what's my time, but I think this is uh, the point I want to bring up at the moment uh, and to allow, uh, I think, Rabbi Stoffenmacher to keep going on that. Um, wow, thank you. I just want to take a couple of moments before we move on. You said a lot of really interesting things there, Rabbi. I thought it was especially interesting how you started out with what we've actually learned in the last six six months, seven months. I have no idea how long it's been anymore. Um, that we are in an age of information. We are in an age of things happening online and being able to utilize that is really important. Um, and espe I especially like hearing that you were talking about um, being the rabbi of more than one congregation. I'm the rabbi of more than one congregation. It's complicated, um, but it also does allow us to uh, to act as enrichers. Um, you talked about rabbi as enrichment for a community who can kind of run on their own. Uh, the small community that I work for at Mosaic Masorti, they don't need to be week by week. They can run their own Torah service. They can lane. They can do all kinds of wonderful things by themselves. And it's been very interesting for me to see what is the role of the rabbi in that case. Um, how do we deepen a community rather than try to assume leadership of all of the technical um, and educational parts of it? Um, also, a lot of what you were talking about, I think, with being in riches reminded me of that very famous Torah quote, Lo Bashamayim He, the Torah is not in heaven. Nobody else has to go and get the Torah for you. Um, I think that's really, really important in the rabbinate, and I very much appreciated hearing that from you. Um, so thank you so much for your response. We are going to hand over now to, um, I believe, uh, Rabbi Stoffenmacher is coming next. I'm going to just repeat the question just in case. Um, so, Rabbi Ariel, what will our communities look like in 10 years and in 20 years? And how do we train the rabbis of today to meet the challenges of tomorrow? Hi, hi to everybody. Thanks for inviting me and congratulations for the ordination. I will make a uh, short five remarks uh, to try to answer the questions at stake. But the first thing I have want to say is that you're asking about the future. And the only thing I'm sure about the future is, is that we will in 10 and 20 years study in Torah and in Latin America drinking mate. All the rest is imagination. So I will try to imagine how the future would look like. Look like. The first remark is regarding the, the state of the world in 10 years. My two favorite futurologists are our well-known Yuval Harari, but a Latin American called Andres Oppenheimer, who writes at the, who speaks at CNN in the States, and, and says what Abby already has said. We live in a, in a world that changes is fast, the pace is faster than ever, and the globalization is brutal. Nevertheless, together with this brutal globalization, we see 
emerging localisms, many emerging localisms, and the social networks change the, 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 the milieu. That's first comment. Second, what's about the Jews within this framework? I will talk about mainly Latin America and liberal, that, that, that kind of Jews. Um, we see a highly intercultural environment uh, and a high rate of intermarriage, intermarriage, intercultural, whatever you call it. Just an example, there's a city in Northern Argentina called Tucumán. The intermarriage rate is above 80%. Okay. Um, <clears throat> we see the Jews more than now fully integrated in the general societies. And uh, we also see another phenomenon, which is what we call emerging communities, uh, former, I would say, Marranos, yeah, that immigrated from Spain and Portugal to Latin America 500 years ago. But now, after being evangelists, many of them, hundreds of thousands, think that they should come back. And there are many communities that uh, being logically converted or auto Defined Jewish are uh, are doing Jewish. Um, and another thing that also Abi said is about the denomination. We see here a non-denominational phenomenon, majority reform, whatever. Um, Jews, um, aside from the crystal small box, do not think about themselves. And uh, and 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 then and that I have just uh, an open question: Is that an opportunity? Instead of a threat, what I said, I think it's an opportunity. We should take it. The third thing, my third comment, is about loneliness. Yeah, you know, social networks. You don't. You do not invite uh, your Facebook friends for your birthday party. Yeah, you don't need that. So, all human beings in general, but Latin Americans in particular, we are warm. We want to hug people. We give two kisses. Uh, we want to be together and um, and we want our souls to be happy. So we 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 want things that only uh, Torah study and community building will give us and not the rest. My fourth comment is about going, I'm going to the answers and the questions, is about the communities. I see in 10 years, uh, two phenomena regarding the communities. First, an agrupation of people in communities of interest. So it's not neighborhood communities, but interest communities. Um, people gather because of what they want to, love to, or whatever, but not because they live here or there. And second, we see a highly decentralized it means non-centralized um, operation, organization. We don't see big, huge communities that winner, the winner takes all. No, we see many communities all over the world. Just for you to know, um, I understand that there are around six to 700 Masoretic congregations in North America with a few million Jews. We have 150 congregations with less than half a million Jews in Latin America. So that, that tells you that we, we, we want to be more dispersed. So the second question, how we train rabbis to cope with all this stuff? <coughs> well, first of all, I don't know, but I will tell you what we do and what we try to do. Um, we train and we, we think we should uh, deepen this training in three different dimensions. The to-do dimension, the to-know dimension, and the to-be dimension. What's the to-do dimension? We should train people to, to, um, to study Torah and perform its work. We should train people to do what we call now soft or management skills to do keruv, to teach uh, other people, and mainly to do libu ruhani, to, well, how do you say libu ruhani, to accompany people, how do you say? 
pastoral care. Uh, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, what people now want is uh, a heart-to-heart -heart conversation. That's that's the, the, that's uh, together with the to do regarding the world. We should train uh, rabbis to to do interreligious dialogue, to be involved in human rights activism. Heschel, Heschel praying with the legs like Alabama. You know? The second uh, dimension is the to know dimension. We should, every rabbi should be uh, comfortable and familiar with all the rabbinic, non-rabbinic Jewish literature. But besides that, he should be familiar with the Limulei Hall, with all the non-Jewish uh, developments in the world. As you might know, um, we, from the onset of the seminary six years ago, we ask, we ask, we come, we, that, that's a requisite, that every, every future graduate has a, at least a BA degree, and we prefer a non-Jewish BA degrees. So, so people can understand the university experience and know how the world thinks and not to be within a capsule. Uh, the third dimension is related to the to be. Yeah? It's, it's the hardest part. Um, how to elevate the spiritual situation of each student. Um, how to refine uh, their midot the tikkun midot, the, their traits, and in refining their traits, to refine the traits of their congregants. And uh, just a, a last comment, and with this I, I, I finish. Um, we uh, understand that uh, what we call, what is called now the soft, um, soft knowledge, non-Torah soft knowledge, should be at the um, not at the core, but should be included in any program. What we, what Yuval Arari calls the four C's, critical thinking, communication, collaboration, and creativity. Um, because that together with Torah with the, will be the only thing that stands. All the rest, for sure, will change. So thank you. Thank you for this time. Wow, thank you there, Rabbi. Um, w once again, you've said so many things that are so interesting and I shouldn't just repeat everything that you've said, um, although I'd quite like to. Um, I must say, you do not have an easy job. As someone who recently went through rabbinical school, there is a, there is a lot uh, to think about for what it is that rabbis need to know. And I appreciate that you've clearly all thought about this so deeply and it benefits people like me and it benefits communities hugely. And um, I wanted to pick up on a few things that you said about how fast the world is changing. Um, there is a lot of imagination that goes into this, to thinking what is the world going to look like and how do we train people to be ready for it? Um, and it, it really struck me when you asked if it's an opportunity or a threat, and then you came to the conclusion that it's all about opportunity. Um, I think that was, a, that was a really wonderful thing to hear. And it also really struck me that many of the things that you mentioned that we need in rabbinical school are the same things actually that we've needed for thousands of years to train our rabbis. It's like the world is changing really fast. And also the majority of these things, knowing Torah, knowing how to sit with people who are unwell, refining our midot, refining our, um, our personal uh, attributes, um, are not that different, even when the world is changing very fast. And I think that's a, that's a really nice thing to hear alongside all of the things that we need to do with communities that are changing. Um, I also think it's really interesting that you're experiencing these um, decentralized organizations. Um, I trained in America and now I'm back in England and I've been in places with big synagogues that are quite centralized for a, for, for a while now. And that is not the case everywhere in the world. Um, Thank you very much for your response. I really appreciated hearing that. I'm next going to call on um, 
on Rabbi Gordon Tucker from the Jewish Theological Seminary in New York in a slightly different kind of demographic, I think, to respond to this very imaginative question of what you think that the Jewish world is going to look like in 10 or 20 years and how it is that you can train rabbis to be prepared for that, Rabbi Tucker. So thank you, Natasha, and to all uh, who've organized this. It's a uh, pleasure to be here. Um, I'm, I'm going to start actually by saying what I, I'm not. I'm actually not the head of the rabbinical school in, uh, in New York. I am filling a new role uh, at JTS, which is a vice chancellor for religious life and engagement. Um, it is, uh, have obviously a lot to do with the religious life and engagement at, uh, at JTS, also being an alumnus and being a congregational rabbi for 24 years. Um, I bring that perspective here. So uh, the other thing that I am not, because is in any symposium such as this, you can't help thinking of the protest of the prophet Amos. I am neither a prophet nor a prophet's disciple. Uh, so when we're called upon to prognosticate about congregations 10 or 20 years hence, um, this uh, demoral is pretty natural. How can you expect to predict such a future when we couldn't have predicted where we are now a mere 10 months ago? Um, and yet, there are things that we've observed and learned in our current unnatural circumstances. Some of these, I think, have not so much taught us something new as much as they have revealed things that we probably should have been attending to uh, for some years. Others, of course, are the creations of new conditions, new techniques, new technologies, and some new paradoxes and dilemmas that will surely still be with us when uh, COVID-19 is, please God, finally vanquished. Uh, so I will not be differing really with what all the wonderful uh, reflections we've heard. I'm, I think I'll probably be uh, illustrating what some of what we've already heard. Now I can illustrate one of these paradoxes that I referred to a moment ago by first referring to my one and a half year old granddaughter. When we've been forced to visit with her via Zoom, she has invariably reached her hands out to the screen in an obvious effort to satisfy her need to touch us. I'm sure that everyone who has been teaching and preaching on Zoom has sensed the absence of the nuanced movements and gestures of the embodied human person. There is a theory known as embodied interaction. It says that three-dimensional interactions are much easier on the mind in certain important ways. So as three-dimensional creatures, we will crave in-person human interactions, especially when our spiritual needs are in question. Another study a bit over a decade ago investigated how people assess the steepness of a hill in front of which they are standing. That is, how do they assess how difficult the terrain that they have to traverse is likely to be? And what the researchers found consistently is that when people are alone, they estimate the steepness of the very same hill to be significantly greater than they do when they're simply accompanied by a friend. And the closer the friend, the less steep the exact same hill is estimated in their minds to be. So we should not be dismissing this crucial role that is played by the physical gathering aspect of synagogue communities, which are after all known as Bate Knesset, places of gathering. And we can expect a certain joy in being able to experience that again, but we need to plan for that joy in a way that will accentuate its enduring importance. And yet, at the same time, and paradoxically, the explosion of virtual gathering, which has been born of the prohibition on physical proximity, has swelled the sheer numbers of those who are regularly engaging with synagogues. My sister reported to me that she never had such a rich experience on the days of awe as when they came to her in her own home, because there was much greater comfort, informality, the opportunity to make it very personal to her. And just about every synagogue I'm aware of has reported a significant increase in attendance at services and other programs when they are virtual. And what's more, the attenders, 
actually come on time. I remember when my congregation did a comprehensive survey years ago in which we asked our members, what would it take to make it more likely for them to attend services more regularly? And many different answers were given, and we faithfully tried to be responsive to some of them. The results were pretty much null. But it now turns out that the most honest answer to the question of what would get you to come more often seems to be this. Not having to come is what is most likely to get me to come. So both sides of this apparent paradox are true. We are, in other words, going to have to recognize that the virtual world is here to stay and will somewhat redefine what community is and what presence means. By the way, halachic issues about minyan, are going to have to take account of that, what presence actually means. But it's also true that the virtual world cannot and should not be allowed to eclipse what is always going to be primary as long as we are three-dimensional embodied creatures. There are, for example, halakhic arguments for the validity of hearing a shofar blown over life's live stream, but it will never be the same spiritually, ritually, as hearing it from an embodied person holding a three-dimensional ram's horn on a street corner near the door of your home. And this was done throughout so many synagogue communities in the US on Rosh Hashanah and perhaps in other places as well, I hope. So there's another element to this that I want to raise as a concern. So it's wonderful in one, and people have touched on this already, both, both speakers. It's wonderful in one way for people who have had to move away from a cherished community to another location. It's wonderful for them to be able to maintain a presence virtually with the community that they have left for worship, for education, for social events. But along with the potential of having your reach extend everywhere, a kind of homogenization threatens to come. And it will likely lead to the domination of the hyperextended space by the congregations with the greatest resources. And what does that then do? Well, as an analogy, consider that we have for some time experienced this draining of local color in the commercial world, certainly we have in the States. Because of the national reach of large chain stores and banks, for example, it's very hard to tell whether you're standing in the central business district of say Birmingham, Alabama or Kansas City, Missouri. They all look the same. Will Jewish life in El Paso, Texas, retain a character that makes it distinct from that of a larger and richer congregation in Los Angeles, whose many services can be accessed from El Paso and will probably be imitated and duplicated. See, I'm concerned about what's called in our tradition minhag makom, local customs and culture. A whole chapter of the Talmud is devoted to it because it's a vital part of what makes religious practice real for people. Such variations and practices, I think, have always proved themselves to be engines for creative growth and development of Jewish tradition. So I worry that the grand interconnectedness that has surely propped us up in wonderful ways during the pandemic also at the same time has the potential to flatten the diversity that local communities can contribute to Jewish vitality. And I suspect that this is even more important in the European context. Add to this the real possibility that the transcontinental reach of synagogue programming will result in the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer. The congregations that are financially better off will, go, will be able to offer more prominent and dynamic speakers, more musically rich services, a host of other high grade programming. And in areas where the local congregation lacks those resources, why would Jews living there not connect to the programmatically more professional and richer live streams? And where will that leave the finances of smaller congregations that despite being small are so vital for the support of their local members as we've already heard. So I know that it goes quite against the general free market zeitgeist to imagine what I'm about to say, but let me just throw it out for consideration. Major League Baseball in America has a system of revenue sharing that helps teams in lower revenue markets sustain themselves 
For the benefit of red, para el ejemplo de Bespoor en Mochi, we may have to consider modes of more central planning and funding in order to ensure that Jewish communities in Jewishly outlying areas don't lose their ability to be there when our grandchildren, now all grown up, are still reaching out to the screens needing to touch somebody nearby. Now, as for the training of rabbis, I will always believe in the critical importance of giving them the tools to control Jewish texts and the rich content of our tradition that can never be compromised. Avi mentioned that we all get the same data today, but it is still true, and I'm sure he would agree with this, that what COVID has taught us is that we still need experts to interpret it. Uh, in the United States, we're dealing with the fact that you could be a radiologist and not know a whole lot about epidemiology. Uh, but when we think of what needs to be added to that core, here's my strong feeling. Yes, facility with developing technological tools is useful, but in the end, there will generally be people in our communities, even in small communities, who are going to have that expertise to contribute. What is much more vital, I think, is that spiritual leaders have greater training in the psychosocial aspects of a technologically changing world so that they can identify both the good, the salutary, and the ill ramifications of those transformations, and so that they can minister to those affected by them. That's the job of pastoral education, as we've already heard. And it must be seen as an essential part of rabbinic training. The Center for Pastoral Education at JTS is devoted to this kind of training, and it and other, effect, and other efforts like it will have a crucial and developing agenda in the decades to come. So much more can be said, but I think timing dictates that I leave it here for now. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi Taka. I am um, blown away by how much you all have to say, even though it's, you know, at the end of every one, I'm like, well, that was it, right? And um, you all have a lot of really interesting things to add. Um, I just want to do a little bit of summarizing. Um, you started out by illustrating some of the more important things about being in person. Loved that story about your granddaughter. Um, and by the way, before we get there, you actually started out with a quote from Amos, which uh, you don't know this about me, but you win serious points for that because I'm really into the minor prophets and especially into Amos. <laughs> So you already won really important points there. Or Ben, um, you'll love the fact that my youngest son's name is Micha Tsefania. Lovely. <laughs> the, absolutely lovely. So you started out with this story about your granddaughter reaching out to the screen. And that really um, touched me quite emotionally because spending so much time on a screen, um, I really deeply feel the need to be in person with people and then turned it around and explained how actually there's a lot to be um, to be given to us in these virtual spaces. And you're completely right. We are all seeing so much more attendance. Um, and you ask questions about what presence actually means and um, demonstrated this with the mitzvah of hearing the shofar. Um, I spent this Rosh Hashanah running around blowing shofar hundreds of times so that people could hear it. And I was, you know, one of the things that was really amazing to me was how people didn't want to hear the shofar over the live, over a live stream if they had an opportunity for me to be, you know, sweatily running up to their front door and knocking so that I can then run far enough away to blow shofar for them. Um, that is something really profound about it. Um, and you talked about the extension of reach and how we actually have a potential issue of bigger communities taking over because their reach is so much bigger. What is this going to mean for Minhag Hamakom? What is this going to mean for custom of the community? Um, which you know speaks very deeply, I think, to what Rabbis Avi and Ariel were talking about with, um, with having a decentralization of communities that actually one of the issues of our virtual life is that we might find that we suddenly centralize in a way that we hadn't intended to. Um, and what I was thinking about when you were talking about that is I, I work for two communities, as you heard earlier, a big community and a small community. Um, we both did something similar in the lead up to Rosh Hashanah. Um, we both made videos 
for people to view before Rosh Hashanah with a lot of the liturgy and learning in it or on Rosh Hashanah if they chose to. Um, and I was really interested in watching them both and how they were both the same idea, but they were completely different when we actually watched them. Uh, my small community made an outtakes video and it was, you know, it was, it was fun and it was playful and the big community was polished and beautiful. And I think, you know, um, even when we are extending, it is important to maintain our own character within that, to know who our communities are and what they actually want when they open up something like that. So I, I do you know, very sincerely hope that we don't lose character through this, um, through this extension of reach. Um, you talked at the end about training rabbis and about how important it is to train us the same way we've been trained for thousands of years when it comes to text and knowledge and expertise and also make sure that we are learning the psycho-spiritual aspects of the rabbinate, um, pastoral education, that these are essential. Um, thank you very much, Rabbi Tucker. That was really wonderful to hear from you. Um, we'll move on now to Rabbi Brad Artson, um, who's joining us from Los Angeles. Hello, it's lovely to see you. Um, Rabbi Artson is the Dean of the Ziegler School where I studied, so I have sat in that office a uh, great many times. And um, you, know, you get the, I think, either the enviable position of going at the end of all of this and being really, really inspired, or the less enviable position of coming at the end of this and going, okay, what should I add to all of that? I don't know which one you're feeling. I hope you're feeling inspired there, Rabbi Artson. Um, our questions are, what is the rabbinate going to look like in a decade or two? And how are we training rabbis to, uh, to be able to face that? Please. Thank you very much, Natasha. So um, I just one critical point to say about my um, biography. I'm also the dean of the Zacharias Frankel College, which trains Masorti rabbis for Europe. Um, that's especially significant today because today we are celebrating the ordination of two wonderful colleagues. I hope to be able to see you all there for that celebration as well. The good news for you is that even though I am running two Masorti institutions, I promise not to speak for twice as long. You're welcome. Gift from Los Angeles. Um, second, I just want to say that it is wonderful to see two of our uh, ordained rabbis. Nitzan, it's great to see you too. Um, it is wonderful to be in the presence of my dean when I was in rabbinical school, uh, Gordon Tucker. He is timeless and ageless and uh, JTS is lucky to have you back. Um, and then, of course, to see so many colleagues and friends. So it's great to see you. I do have several responses. There are no surprise, many areas we agree, and a couple areas where I think we strongly disagree. The first thing I want to say, and I'm going to speak quickly, because having four rabbis speak in a single panel is an act of remarkable, I'm going to leave that blank. First, um, we have entered an age of international diversity. And what I mean by that is I think it's entirely for the good that there are centers of rabbinic learning in various places because those various places have very different styles and very different needs. The core notions of Masorti Judaism remain the same, fidelity to text, love of academic learning, um, the ability to honor that Judaism has a history and must continue to have a history, but built into the idea of having a history is the understanding that Judaism both is constant over time and changes over time, and that it reflects actual and real communities. So having a European academic center, having an Israeli academic center, having two centers in the United States in very different locations, uh, and having a center in Latin America, all to the good and something I think we should all celebrate and we need to all work to support all of those centers in all of their difference. Those differences are going to grow. There are some issues coming down the pike where frankly the reality of what's going on in the United States is radically at odds with what's going on in Israel or in Europe and what we're not going to solve the problem with is by flattening it for the sake of consistency. We're gonna to have to learn to be able to hold on to our core values 
and recognize that having a history means that each community will have to follow the tradition as is needed in their own community. When I installed Gershom Sizomo in Uganda, I told his community that I knew we would be successful on the day that he made a ruling that we hated in Los Angeles because that way I would know he was actually applying the halakha as it was needed in Mabali, that East African halakha can't possibly look like Los Angeles halakha in its details without betraying one of the two communities, possibly both. So we are gonna enter into an age in which there are gonna be some painful and challenging conversations in the conservative movement and in the Masorti movement, and we are gonna see diverse communities having very strong feelings about very diverse outcomes. And we're gonna to have to be able to honor that and find a way to still be brothers and sisters to each other, still be family and support each other in doing what's right for our own communities. I wanna speak in some disagreement to what Gordon uh, laid out as a concern, the, the concern about making sure we support little com communities. Of course, I agree with him on that. Um, but I don't think we can at the same time talk about how precious and wonderful the small communities are, and then also um, try to avoid the fact that in an age of more and more competition, that if those communities fold because people don't find their services attractive, the solution isn't to chastise people for not finding them unattractive. We're gonna have to either make them really charming, or we're gonna have to be willing to say, this is an age in which the centralization results in a certain homogeneity of institutions because of what they are capable of doing. So just two things to say, I'm a big fan of Amazon. I know I'm not supposed to be, but I am because here I can sit in my little COVID shelter under my house arrest and I can get anything I want delivered to my home, which I could not get when there was just the mom and pop shop down the street. So. I'm happy with that. And I think that makes my life better. And I think a lot of people think that, which is why they keep supporting those big institutions. But I always wanna say, I'm a member of a little tiny shul and I like my small synagogue and I don't go to one of the big major congregations. I like being in a room where I know everybody and I like the intimacy that that. So rather than fear, what large size is gonna do. I want us to lean into it. I want us to let people figure out what it is they really want. And that has been an Achilles heel for our movement from the beginning. We've been very good at telling people how they should practice Judaism and not so good at attending to what they're actually doing. Um, and so generation after generation of conservative and Masorti rabbis throw themselves into the breach of halachic observance or literacy or whatever, and our people keep disappointing us, which then blinds us to what they're actually doing, which is building wonderful, wonderful communities. Second thing I need to say about that centralization process is like it or not, over the last hundred years, the Jewish people have centralized. The vast majority of our population is now located in two centers. Within those two national centers, the vast majority of the Jewish population is located in five cities. Five cities around the world have 85% of the Jewish population. That is by no means to say that the other places Jews live aren't wonderful and shouldn't be supported, but we're not gonna fight that trend by decrying it. We have to understand it. We have to lean into it. We have to see what are the responses that that new reality entails and needs from us. Um, next, obviously the meaning of denominational identity has changed and has changed differently around the world. But people are less loyal to brand label. That's true for the, the synagogue they go to, that's true for the denomination with which they affiliate. And so we have to also, frankly, be more competitive. We have to offer better ideas better services. We have to give people ways of plugging into the text that we so venerate, the mitzvot that we so love, not so much by guilting them, but by showing them the wonders that that adds to their lives. They need to see that our approach to Judaism is one in which their souls can thrive and their communities can help people meet their existential needs better. Um, that, of course, includes attention in rabbinical school to practical rabbinics, and both Ziegler and Frankel with the other seminaries do that very well and extensively, 
far more so than I was in when I was in rabbinical school, explicitly attending to issues of social action and social justice. We're not going to speak to today's rabbinical students if that is, doesn't occupy a primary place within the academy. And I think that's all for the good. Um, mention has been made of the prophets of Israel. Certainly the centrality of justice as itself a religious obligation. And we may differ as to what constitutes justice in particular instances, but the pursuit of justice justice has to be a central value of ours. And then the other big change is the integration of spirit. And what I think of that, uh, without getting too metaphysical, is the idea that we are integrated beings, that our hearts and our heads and our souls all feed each other, and that we can't seal one off or mistrust that aspect of our being. We have to feed that through song, through dance, through motion, through what used to be alien spiritual practices. Many of my rabbinical students meditate, many of them practice yoga, and that doesn't mean they don't daven. It takes a lot longer now to have a spiritual life, but they're finding nourishment in places that we used to look askance at, and that has to stop. We will always be centered in text and mitzvot, but what has changed in my 20 some odd years uh, as a dean is that Judaism, as it's practiced by the Masorti movement, is now overtly egalitarian. That halachic decision has been decided. Um, and when I started in the rabbinical school, I talked halachic pluralism and different ways, and I meant by that egalitarian or non-egalitarian. Those days are gone. It, it's true, I believe, in all of our seminaries that a non-egalitarian student would be very uncomfortable and that many other students and faculty members would be very uncomfortable with that student not recognizing their legitimacy. I think we need to lean into that and we need to embrace that as well, that we are those clusters of Jews who advocate halakhic egalitarianism. And that also can take diverse forms in the details, but the core value of come as you are, that has to animate our communities. Last thing I want to say, if we learn nothing else from COVID, it's that buildings matter differently than we ever thought they did. And that, in fact, we are able to connect to each other in all kinds of ways. I feel your presence right now. I hope you're feeling mine. There's a way in which miraculously we are able to float the globe. We are able to listen to talks that are given by great scholars in distant places that we haven't visited because they come right onto our desk through the computer and through Zoom and other technologies. This is something to rejoice in. It will never replace the physical presence for those who want the physical presence. But I don't think that guilting people about it or worrying about it is, is a necessary response. One of the things that we've learned over the last year is that a whole lot of people who couldn't go to a physical room for services now can and do. It will be impossible at the end of COVID to say, well, yes, we've demonstrated that we have the capacity to include you in our communities, but now we choose not to again. That will be a foolish response. So part of what's coming is a conversation about new ways of integrating being physically present and technological ways of reaching out to people who can't because they're sick, because they're frail, because frankly, they're just tired or they don't wanna be in the room or because they love a community that's far away and they want to be there. Alana and I sat on the couch the first time I haven't led services for the high holidays since 1987, which is before when many of my rabbinical students were born. Um, and we floated to Aaron Alexander's synagogue uh, in Washington, D.C., which was lovely. The only problem was that Ni'ila ended about three hours too early, and so then I had to spend the rest of the day just dealing with myself. Um, so I sang Hinnani to myself and my dog for the next three hours. Friends, it's wonderful to see you. Let's not lose hope. We have something magnificent in the young rabbis who are joining our ranks, in the congregants who come to our communities. We have deep, deep abilities in our faculties at our different seminaries and at the rabbis who are out in the world truly doing God's work with, with the best lay people on the planet. So let's build on that and let's move forward. Thank you. I look forward to celebrating the ordination with you very soon. 
Thank you so much, Rabbi Artson, and I apologize for uh, being overly excited about introducing you as the Dean of Ziegler and not excited enough about introducing you also as the, um, as the head of the Zacharias Frankel School, which is why we're here today. Thank you for picking that up. Um, interestingly, I feel like your, um, your response can probably be summarized in two words. You said these two words a few times, lean in. Um, you know, we have a whole bunch of challenges and a, and a changing world in front of us, and we can choose to um, to sort of de denounce ways in which we don't like how it's going, or we can lean into them. It reminds me of um, what Rabbi Stoffenmacher said about, um, is that an opportunity or is it a threat? that the way in which we read what's in front of us really does change the way in which we respond to it. And you spoke about this specifically with international diversity, um, which is really interesting to me as a British rabbi trained in America. A lot of my first year and a half has been remembering how to be a British rabbi instead of an American rabbi. Um, you also spoke about the age of competition. We've heard about some of the potential issues with having this wide open virtual world um, but actually maybe it does encourage us to think about what we're offering and what it is people need. Um, a moment ago when uh, Rabbi Tucker was speaking and I responded talking about the two videos that were made in my two communities I think it's actually a good example of that. Um, my small community would not have enjoyed the video that my large community put together. It was not right for them. Um, and leaning into that is also important. Um, and you also talked about training justice as being central, um, integration of spirituality and how the age of pluralism is gone and we need to, and I'm gonna say it again, lean into the fact that we are now an egalitarian movement, um, especially taking from your uh, from your response right now, how you ended with um, let's not lose hope. Um, I think that was a wonderful way to finish up this session together. Um, it is, as I mentioned, a real dream team that we had today hearing from all four of you. I know that I took an incredible amount from it and I hope that everyone here took an incredible amount from it too. Um, we could have done this over four hours and not run out of things to say and interesting responses to have. And I want to thank the four of you for bringing such incredible, interesting thoughts and also for managing to do it all within an hour. Good job. That's, a, that's impressive for four rabbis. That's the word I'm going for, Rabbi Artson, when you said very, I don't know what to say there, impressive is what I'm going with. Um, we're going to now take a short break for 15 minutes. We'll then come back together. When we come back together at quarter two, um, we'll be joined by Rabbi Peretz, Rabbi Cheryl Peretz, who is the Associate Dean of the Ziegler School in LA. And she has particular responsibility for rabbinical placement. And also Matt Plen, who's the executive director of Masorti Judaism UK. That will be in 15 minutes from now. So um, because I'm English, I'm gonna suggest that you all go make yourselves a cup of tea. Um, but if you're not English, you can, you can do what you want with that 15 minutes and I'll see you back here soon. Thank you so much to our four rabbis for your responses. Um, and really, I owe a lot of personal thanks to both of you, because thanks to both of you, I get to do the job that I'm doing, which I think is going to be part of what we talk about today. Not about me. I'm excited about me. You don't have to be that excited about me, but about what it means to do rabbinical placement, um, what it means to, to get rabbis into the right roles. Um, from the perspective, not of people like me, but of communities like yours. So community wants a rabbi. How does that then come into fruition? I'm going to start out, uh, Rabbi Peretz is going to start by um, giving us a short Tzvah Torah, a short message of Torah about the relationship between the rabbi and the community. Um, rabbi Peretz, please. Thank you. Good morning. And I just want to say, Natasha, I really care about 
you and your professional career. So I'm always happy to talk about you. So, um, but it's wonderful to be with all of you and um, to see some new faces, some familiar faces. And, um, and really we wanna to try to have a conversation, but before we do, I wanted to um, just give us a little bit of context. Because um, for me, when I think about rabbinic placement, I first try to go back to what do we know about leadership assumption and leadership transition from our tradition. And one of the earliest places is when Moshe is about to um, end his career and he knows that he needs to find succession, right? He needs to make sure the community is led and it's a really fascinating passage of the Torah when Moses tells God how God needs to help appoint a new um, leader. And he talks about this new leader with several characteristics that I think are important as we think about what it means to, um, to think about engaging rabbis who are the equivalent leaders for our type of community that uh, Joshua was after Moses. And Moses says that this needs to be a person It needs to be someone who will go out before the people and um, come in before the people and who will help take them out and bring them in. And this causes a whole debate and discussion amongst the rabbis about what this means. And Rashi actually tells us that this is done to help us distinguish really clearly on what we mean. Because Rashi says, this is someone who's not going to bring them in and take them out like a king, not who's going to be above the people and demanding things, but rather is someone who's going to lead from within and be with the people and who is going to uh, help everyone find their place and elevate themselves in order for the community to grow and to build. The, the text of Bamibar uh, here goes on and says that this needs to be a person who is set in front of Eliezer the priest and in front of the community. And it's the them, not God, even though it's fascinating that the call comes from God, but the investment comes from the community. The community is gonna invest in that, in that leader, in Joshua in this case, the ability to actually um, help them, to guide them, to minister to them. And I think that this is, uh, a really important piece when we think about rabbinic leadership for the 21st century, right? Your communities in whatever fashion they are, and I know very um, diverse in Europe, um, may be in need of different elements of leadership at different moments. But what ties it together is that you're all looking for people or will, will look for people who have the ability to inspire and who have the ability to lead from within and who can help do so in a way that cultivates the best of what the community has to offer. And that ultimately is why I think that Moses is blessing to Joshua at the end is chazak ve'ametz, right? Be strong and of good courage because the process of growing community, the process of choosing leadership and then following that leader into the world of your community is indeed something that requires strength and requires courage. And so I wanna bless us, whether it's in this moment, in the future, near future or far future, that when you're in a transition, that you think back to Moses and Joshua and hold on to these values as you begin to think about rabbinic leadership. Thanks. Thank you, Rabbi Peretz. Um, I want to invite Matt Plan now to talk a little bit about um, how he and the movement have gone about developing and recruiting rabbis 
here in the UK um, on our end of the screen over here. Well, first of all, thank you, Natasha, for your for your warm words. Um, and, and it's a real pleasure for us to have you as one of our rabbis and to be able to work with you as well. So the uh, the warm feelings are certainly mutual. Um, and I've, I've also been really pleased to, to work with uh, Rabbi Cheryl in preparing this session. It was great that we got a chance. We've corresponded over the years. We knew each other by name, but it's, it's been great to get a chance to um, to actually meet and to talk. So uh, this has been a good opportunity. Um, and I also want to thank Rabbi Chaim Wiener, who invited me to speak at this session um, and who recognised that actually in the UK, we've had a lot of success. And, and it's probably the most the thing I'm the most proud of in my years in working for the movement and we've had a lot of success in developing a really good, strong pipeline of new rabbis for our communities. And we invested a lot of time and energy into that process because we understood it was the most the single most important thing for the future of our communities to have strong rabbinic leaders. Um, so what I'd like to do for about 15, well, maybe a bit less than 15 minutes is share a few stories with you of rabbis who we have successfully developed and uh, recruited. I'm not going to share Natasha's story because, you know, she, she's right here. You can ask her afterwards how, how we work with her. Um, but there are three other rabbis that I'd like to, to share their stories with you. I haven't asked their permission, so I hope they don't mind, but I, I will only say nice things about them, so I, it should be okay. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about our strategy. How did we get into a position in the UK where we've been able to build this pipeline of new rabbis? And I'll just caveat this with one you know, one kind of proviso, which is that I'm, I'm aware that the movement in the UK is um, a bit bigger and has more professional staff um, and, and a little bit more infrastructure than our communities elsewhere in Europe. Um, so I'm aware of that and I'm aware that we can't necessarily all do exactly the same things that the UK has done. Um, but I hope that some of the um, some of our story hopefully will be relevant and useful. Uh, and once I finish, Cheryl's going to talk a little bit from her perspective and we'll then have lots of time for questions and answers. So I'm going to start with three uh, stories. The first one is, uh, and I'm, I, I mentioned people by name, I think I think it's fine. Um, the first person I want to talk about is Rabbi Zahavit Chalev, who many of you will know. And uh, Zahavit, Zahavit um, worked in, in, was involved in the movement for many years. She's one of the founders of our Asif Minyan at New North London Synagogue in London. Um, and Zahavi also worked for New North London Synagogue in, for many years in a kind of para-rabbinic capacity, running the conversion course, doing work with young families um, and more. And she decided she wanted to train to be a rabbi. And that gave us a push as a movement to think, OK, so how do we how do we do that? Um, there's no majority conservative rabbinic training school in the UK. Zahavi had to stay in the UK for family reasons and we didn't have the money to support her. And we had to decide what to do. And she gave us the push to actually make a, a strategy happen. And, and what we did with, with, with Zahavit is that we worked very closely with New North London Synagogue. We agreed that between the movement and the community, we would co-fund her. We raised the money to be able to do that um, from donors. Um, we then approached Leah Beck College, which is the Reform and Liberal Rabbinic Training Seminary here in London. And we entered into some negotiations with them about how could we adapt their curriculum um, possibly to be able to, to, to make it suitable for training a Masorti rabbi. And we went through a very constructive process with Leah Beck College, got to a place where we were happy with the curriculum. We then went through a second process of negotiating with our rabbis um, in the UK to make sure they were comfortable with the fact of training, with the idea of training Masorti rabbis at a reform liberal training institute, and they were happy with the curriculum. We got their approval um, and we set Zahabit off on her journey um, co-funded by two communities with a curriculum which we'd worked out with our partners in the reform and liberal movements um, and five years later Zahavit received smicha um, she now works for New North London Synagogue as part of their rabbinical team and also um, serves one of our small communities and um, for several Shabbatot a year our community which is called New Essex Masorti Synagogue and she's a real she's become a real asset to the movement so that's story number one a different story story number two um, I'd like to share the story of another rabbi, Rabbi Ronnie Tabak. Again, I'm sure many of you will have come across him. Now, Ronnie grew up in the UK. By the way, so did Zahavi, both UK-born uh, rabbis. Uh, Ronnie grew up in the UK in a reform family. Both his parents are reform rabbis. Um, and Ronnie gravitated during his early adulthood, I suppose, to the Masorti movement, spent a lot of time studying, for example, at the conservative 
yeshiva in Jerusalem and decided he wanted to become a rabbi. And Ronnie took himself off and managed to arrange his own funding to study at uh, JTS um, in New York. Um, and while he was at JTS in New York, he got himself accepted into a, a scholarship program there, um, the, Gladstein, the, the Gladstein Fellowship, which it, within which he was paired up with, one, with a small community as a rabbinic leader. And Ronnie wanted to negotiate with the fellowship that he would be able to be paired up with a community in the UK with the aim of returning back to the UK upon uh, receiving Smicha. Um, at that point, we got involved as a movement because the Gladstein Fellowship insisted that we guarantee Ronnie a job upon, ordina upon receiving ordination. Now, we didn't have a job to offer him three years out at the time, but nonetheless, I, we took the decision to sign the piece of paper. We said, yes, we will commit to finding Ronnie a job when he graduates. Figuring out that we figuring that we had three years to work out how we would do that. So we signed a piece of paper, not knowing how we would find him a job or fund it, um, but having faith that we'd be able to do so. And we paired him up. We created this shidduch between Ronnie and a community called New Stoke Newington Synagogue, which is one of our small communities, small, very fast growing community. Um, and we arranged for Ronnie, we, we raised enough money that Ronnie could come back to the UK several times a year to serve as the rabbi of this community. We gradually helped him build that relationship. We also nurtured the community so that they would grow and, and we tried to give them the support necessary to grow their membership. More members means more money, means more financial capacity. Upon receiving ordination, uh, Ronnie was offered a position with New Stoke Newington. Now they could, um, they could afford to employ him for, I think, a third of his time. And as a movement, we then scrambled to kind of find him the rest of a job. So again, we um, entered into a partnership with New North London Synagogue. They cropped up again in this story. Um, and they offered to employ him for another 50% of his time as part of their rabbinical team. And we as a movement took him on for the remainder of his job, building up to 100% and asked him to work with, to do educational work with uh, young people. Uh, in Naam and in Maron. And again, we've had a very successful story with Ronnie. He's now in his fourth year of fourth year of his Rabbanut, doing really well in Stoke Newington, growing that community. He's done sterling work in developing uh, Jewish learning activities among young people. I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, and that was a different model of, uh, of success. Third and final story. I'm gonna now talk about a rabbi named uh, Adam Zagoria Moffat. Uh, Adam Zagoria Moffat who is the rabbi in St. Albans Masorti Synagogue, which is in Hertfordshire, north of London. And this is a different model of how to recruit a rabbi. By the way, I have to, I have to apologize because I'm aware, we've, I'm aware we've got people on the line from Ziegler and from, uh, and from the Zakaria Frankel School. And all of the examples I've given are rabbis who graduated from different schools. So I just want to say that we, we value very much our relationship with, uh, with Ziegler. We do have rabbis who've come from that school. Um, who we're very proud of. We don't yet have a rabbi who's graduated from Frankel, but we look forward to that day as well. And I've only picked on, on Learbeck College and JTS by pure coincidence. So, uh, so just, to, just to put that out there. So back to the story, Rabbi Adam, uh, so St Albans, I'll, I'll start with the community actually. So St Albans Masorti were again, a very successful, fast growing community. They had about 300 adult members at the time. Um, and they'd also employed a few rabbis very, very successfully. Um, they'd started uh, with part-time rabbis. There was a rabbi called Paul Glantz um, a number of years ago. They then employed Rabbi Jeremy Gordon, who went on to become the full-time rabbi at New London Synagogue, now working with Rabbi Natasha. Um, and they'd employed a third rabbi, Rabbi Rafi Kaiserbluth, who subsequently went and took a job in um, Australia. And many of you will, will know what, two or three of those, of those characters. Um, after Rafi left, they were looking for their new appointment. And it wasn't an immediately obvious local candidates they went out and they went through the rabbinical assemblies placement uh, process in a very kind of organized and official way they advertised for a rabbi um, they interviewed they attracted a number of candidates they interviewed them um, and they ultimately ended up plumping for rabbi adam he was a very impressive candidate and he's and he's doing extremely well here as a rabbi and the interesting part of the story that i'd like to share is 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 that the challenge in recruiting a rabbi from the States is primarily one of money because our salaries in, in Europe don't compare with the salaries that rabbis can earn in the States and our career structure also doesn't compare. You know, you take a job in the States, there are hundreds and hundreds of communities, there's a career structure, you can progress 
in Europe, things are much more limited because there are fewer um, Jews and fewer communities. And St Albans, uh, what they did, I think, really skillfully, and the movement supported them to do this, but actually they were very autonomous in how they carried this out, is they created a really impressive and attractive package to be able to offer um, Rabbi Adam. And I don't only mean the money. I mean, they obviously had to raise enough money, but what they had to do was impress upon him how attractive a community they were in which to work. So on the one hand, that was about how good their lay leadership was, what kind of culture they had as a community, how could they appeal to him with their culture of learning and tefillah and volunteering, and all of the things that you would want to see in, a, in an attractive community. And as well, they had financial arguments, which was they managed to create a package where they could show that a lower salary in, in Europe was worth more than the equivalent in the United States because of the things like the provision of free medical care and free schooling and stuff like that, which you get here and obviously in the States you have to pay for. Um, and they successfully recruited Adam. The movement supported them with some kind of human resource knowledge and we helped interview and give a broader perspective. They brought him in and, rabbis, and, and Rabbi Adam has been working successfully in St Albans ever since. So those are, those are my three, three stories, three very different stories. One about a homegrown rabbi who came through a dedicated Mosorshi track, which we had organized and funded at a local rabbinic training school. The second story about someone who took himself off from the UK to study overseas and we, who we managed to attract back through a financial partnership. But more importantly, I think through nurturing him through his rabbinical studies and creating a, a shiduch, a relationship with the community. And the third story, which is about how can you successfully recruit a rabbi through the rabbinic assemb rabbinical assemblies placement program and overcoming some of the disadvantages, some of the structural disadvantages we have by virtue of being in Europe rather than in North America. I want to say one more, there's one more little section to, to what I'd like to share with you, which is just to give the, the, the big picture kind of strategic overview, because um, in, in the last four years, taking into account to have it Ronnie and Adam, in the last four years, we've actually absorbed four new homegrown rabbis back into the movement in the UK. We've also recruited two more from outside, one from the States and one from the reform movement here in the UK. We've started to fund two more students who are both studying at the moment. We've encouraged a further NIAM graduate into training independently. And we've got one or two more prospective students waiting to start in the next few years, both of whom are NIAM graduates. Um, and the question really that I wanted to, to raise with you is how have we managed to get into that position? I think it's, you know, this is a very different position than one we were in 10 years ago and even five years ago. Um, how do we bring it about? And I think, I think there were four steps that we went through. So the first step is what I would call the funnel effect. You know, a funnel is a, has a, has a wide opening at the bottom and a narrow opening at the top or, or vice versa. Um, and you pour things into the wide end and you get stuff out of the narrow end. And that's what we've done with rabbinic, or with rabbinic candidates. Um, in other words, we've started by trying to get the biggest possible group of young people to take an interest in Jewish learning and in, in the possibility of becoming a rabbi. We've done that in, in a few ways. We've made sure that whenever we have Noam camps, we make sure there are rabbis there building relationships with young people and showing them the value of being a rabbi and of Jewish learning and of being involved in Jewish religious life. We have run um, Jewish learning programs, a slightly smaller number. So, for example, we have a program called Kelim, which we run for university students at the Conservative Yeshiva every summer, but this one just gone for obvious reasons. Um, we have Tay Midrash for young adults and now for teenagers to operate within the movement. We've used creative techniques of getting more young people involved in those programs, for example, paying them to study, which I know other parts of the, in other parts of the Jewish world is quite common, but we've gone down that path as well and it's been very successful. Um, We've put effort into building networks of Jewish learners and making sure that we've got a relationship with all of the young people in the movement who are interested in Jewish learning and religious leadership. Um, and the philosophy or the assumption is that if, if we have hundreds of young people at the wide end of the funnel, we will get to the two or three rabbinic candidates that we need at the narrow end of the funnel. And that's proved to be true. Um, the second thing we've done is that we've developed relationships with a range of rabbinical schools. As I said before, we've got a relationship with Lievek College in London. We have relationships with JTS and Ziegler in the States. We have a relationship with, uh, we have relationships with other schools around the world, which students have not attended yet, but we're, we're hoping they will. And this year we actually made the decision that we were happy to sponsor a student at Hebrew College in uh, Massachusetts as well. Not a conservative school, but we decided that it fit our needs as well. And we've, we're sponsoring a student there this year. 
um, based on her choice. So the relationship to those schools so they can help us meet our needs is really critical. Third step that we had to go through, and this is you know uh, unavoidable in, in any discussion about Jewish communal life, I think, is that we had to raise money to fund our students. Um, because to fund a rabbinical student typically costs about 25,000 pounds per year of their studies. Um, the, the amounts vary depending on where they're studying, but that's the typical amount. Um, everyone can, tra can translate that into euros or dollars or whatever currency makes sense for them. But I, I guess that's probably around the 30,000 euro mark. Um, and to train two students at once, which is what we thought we needed, we had to raise a lot of money. Um, we started off by raising money from donors, but we quickly realized that actually we needed a very secure, solid base of funding for this core initiative. Um, and we tapped into our community's self-interest and we persuaded them all to levy a small fee on their members, which they would then contribute into a rabbinical training fund. And across our 4,000 adult members here in the UK, we've managed to raise enough money to be able to train two rabbis um, at a time. Uh, by the way, that's one of the examples of the movement in the UK being slightly larger and, and further down the track of development than some of the communities in Europe. So I, I take that as a, I take that into account and it might not be relevant for everyone at that particular point. The final step that I'd like to just share, and then I'm gonna stop talking, um, that we have, the fourth step we've gone through is that we have taken responsibility as a movement for supporting our communities to recruit rabbis, and maybe most importantly, to pull together full-time portfolio jobs. What's the problem? That many of our small communities can't, they want a rabbi, but they can't afford a whole one. And you can't recruit half a rabbi. Um, you have to recruit full-time rabbis. Um, and as a movement, we've been able to piece together the pieces of a, of a jigsaw to, in, to create full-time jobs. So for example, Rabbi Natasha, when she came to us, started off working, I, may, I might get my numbers a bit wrong, but she was working roughly two thirds of her time for New London Synagogue, just less than a third of her time for Mosaic, Mosaic Masorati in Hatch End in, in West, Northwest London, and the remainder of her, of her time for Noam, Masorati Youth. Um, Rabbi Ronnie that I mentioned before, as I said, was working for New Stoke Newington, for New North London, and for the movement. Now, it's not ideal to work like that, and a full-time job is obviously better in one community, but this was certainly better than nothing, and this enabled us to recruit rabbis who we otherwise would have, would have lost because they'd have gone to a full-time job somewhere else. And I think that's the benefit of being in a movement as opposed to just being individual isolated uh, communities. Um, just to recap really, really quickly, the four steps I think we've gone through were, first of all, the funnel effect, second of all, relationships with rabbinical schools, third of all, having the money to fund students, and fourth of all, supporting our communities and pulling together full-time uh, jobs, which we could recruit rabbis into. Um, I'm gonna stop talking now, we'll hear from uh, Rabbi Cheryl, and hopefully afterwards there'll be lots of time for questions. Um, I just want to um, make uh, make my way in here and thank you, Matt. That was really, really interesting. Um, also, from my perspective, you know, you're talking about my colleagues and friends, so it was quite interesting to hear about about their stories from your perspective too. And also, by the way, all fantastic rabbis and great people. And um, just reflecting on what you said about when you were talking about the funnel effect, I've never heard you do this, this spiel before. So this is new to me hearing you put it out that way. Um, but I recognize in my own story, oh, like that's what happened at this point in my story. I remember when I first started talking about um, the possibility of going um, to rabbinical school pretty immediately having multiple people having coffee with me and it was clear that someone behind the scenes I don't know if it was you at that point or if it was someone else but someone behind the scenes was going this is a person thinking about rabbinical school this person needs to buy them coffee and talk about this and it really does start that way and um, I think I would have gone to rabbinical school anyway but it, but that's um, it was definitely very helpful to have that um, to be a part of that funnel effect. So thank you for that. I just want to bring up a question from the chat. We will, I do um, encourage you to write questions in. Uh, this is just a very short practical one. So I thought, Matt, that you could answer this now about um, Rabbi Joel Rembaum wanted to ask about Rabbi Zahavi. Um, was, her, was the RA involved in her smicha? Was she admitted to the RA? What's the relationship there? Could you respond to that quickly? Yeah, sure. As far as I know, so I don't, I don't know I can't comment on, on Rabbi Zahavit's status as an RA member or not, I don't know, but um, 
but our students who have been who, who have graduated through different uh, training schools have been admitted to the RA in the past and the RA have recognized them as long as they're coming through a, um, a recognized school and then they're working in the Masorti community um, so we haven't I don't think we specifically liaised with the RA about that but it's never been a problem and they have been RA recognized wonderful thank you um Rabbi Cheryl Paris, if you would like to take over and talk to us a little bit about your perspective on the uh, recruitment of rabbis. So, yeah, so thank you. And Matt, that was really amazing. My job is because we recognize that not all communities are like the UK. I'm going to attempt to talk about three steps that I think you have to think about if you want to engage a rabbi. But before I do, because I'm a rabbi, I have two things to say. The first is that I want to say, um, you know, people often imagine, people from uh, within the US and outside often imagine we have this incredible infrastructure for um, developing rabbis and uh, creating the, the stream. And I just wanna say, I wish that we were as organized in our movement here as um, the Masorti movement in the UK has been. So we have a lot to learn from you. So I found what you said fascinating and really helpful. The other thing that I wanna make sure that everyone here knows, because I know they you represent many different countries, is that um, both the Zacharias Frankel College and the Ziegler School, as well as I'm sure the other schools that Matt mentioned, but I know these two really well, um, are not only eager to help work with communities to help foster rabbinic development, but also participate in the um, funding structure for that, right? So for example, in Germany, education at all levels is, um, is covered by the government and there's an additional stipend for living for students. And at the Ziegler School, although most students uh, are on some form of financial aid, international students, um, because they're not eligible for US government loans, if they show the financial um, need and necessity, are given additional financial aid to cover tuition. So as you think about developing this funnel, that would mean that your the, the individual student and or the community would be responsible for living expenses primarily. Um, and I think that's an important piece to know in thinking about the funnel. But I, I wanna talk now about um, hiring a rabbi, right? Because uh, that's the long-term strategy of developing the funnel. But what does it mean if you um, need a rabbi? And I wanna talk about it in three different categories. What are three different questions? What do we need? Who do we need? And how do we do it? Right, so the first is that um, if your community is now or in the future thinking about a rabbi, that's really a first, the first invitation you have is an invitation to self-reflection, an invitation to ask, what is it that we need from a rabbi to create a job description? It doesn't look the same in every community, the number of hours, the type of programming, the type of work that someone might do. I don't know how it is in many of your communities, but as an example, in our communities here in the US, more and more rabbis are called upon to have um, skills of what we would normally have called an executive director, right? To have budgeting and financing and fundraising. Maybe that's not part of what you need, but maybe it is. So you have to ask yourself, what is it that we need? Who are we as a community? What are our priorities? What's important to us? Um, and, um, and, and that will help define um, the beginning of the search process. I'm well aware that many of the communities in Europe are much more entrepreneurial and so that may well be an example of one of the things that you need is um, the outreach to the larger community or to a internal structure of the Jewish community like there is in Germany um, and, and so forth. So really asking the question of who are we? How do we define ourselves? What does it mean to be Masorti in communities where there may be things to the right or to the left? Again, that looks different in every um, community. And so it's important not to make assumptions that 
all Masorti communities look the same and therefore we don't have to ask that question of who are we. The second um, question that I think that we have to ask is who do we need? And by this, I mean, what are the characteristics of rabbi that we need? Is it the scholar? Is it the person who can technically lead davening, who can lead the prayer services, who can sing because that is um, important in our community? Is it someone who has um, the ability to teach or to speak profoundly. I know that you all want all of these things, um, trust me, but part of this is creating the priorities, right? Because if you think that you're gonna go in and say you want it all, well, um, you know, the Mashiach will come eventually, um, but likely not um, tomorrow. So the question is how do you um, set priorities for um, who you need? And um, there is a wonderful exercise for doing this that you can do with your entire community or even with like your leaders, where you sort of put down on, ha first have everybody brainstorm what it is they think they're looking for in a person, and you'll end up with a list of about 50. And then whoever's in the room gets five votes and they go and they put a check mark next to the ones that are the most important to them. And then those qualities become the driving forces for who you need, right? It helps pinpoint what the priorities are of whatever group you're actually doing this exercise with. So who you need becomes a really important part of that. And then the third piece that I wanna talk about is how you go about searching. So um, within your community, I suspect you have some sort of leadership structure that would determine whether this is done by um, the board, a subset of the board, a search committee that's representative of different groups within the community. That's done a little bit different in different places. I do think it's really important that it's not the decision of one or two people, but it's a collective process. Um, and the other thing that I want to say about how you search is um, that, uh, that through the schools, through the rabbinical assemblies um, placement service, there are ways to list the job that become automatic. But I also know that in, um, in Europe, much of this happens um, a little differently. And so I want to um, just encourage the, the, the process of, of networking and relationship building. Um, it's a little different than the rest of the world where you might put out an advertisement for a job and everybody hears about it. But if you're, whatever country you might be in, in Europe, talking with Rabbi Chaim Wiener or with Matt or calling us at the Franco College and talking to Sandra or talking to Rabbi Natasha because she has connections all over the world or um, contacting us here at the Ziegler School. All of these become networking possibilities to, um, to increase the um, likelihood of finding the good candidates. There is obviously a process for actual application, but this is the way to expand, I think, the network. Um, I also wanna encourage you to consider with the Frankel College, the opportunity to have uh, an intern that could develop into a longer term relationship, either with that particular student or with people coming out of the school. This is a different way of creating a funnel that, um, that Matt was talking about, right? So it's not the, um, the, the 10 year plan, but it is a progressive plan for getting to know someone in a rabbinic capacity, giving them growing responsibilities in a constructive way, and then eventually perhaps having them or one of their colleagues serve as your rabbi. Um, lastly, what I wanna say about how to search, and there's a lot more, I'm, I'm gonna um, be happy to answer more questions, but I, I do wanna encourage that list of qualities that I was talking about that you um, would create in who you need, needs to follow through in the how you search. So um, one of the ways that I often 
recommend that people do this is by um, creating a rubric for evaluating your candidates against the qualities or uh, in, in the categories of the qualities that you identify. So that when you have someone interviewing and you're talking to them, you're evaluating them based on what you said your priorities were and not some other random uh, uh, perspective. So um, that becomes a really important thing. And then the last thing that I want to say about this is, and I know that we're in different places around this in different parts of the world, but I want to also really encourage you as you think about it to ask yourself, um, what do we need in a rabbi and not um, the superficial categories that might be um, lending to overlooking good candidates. Um, what age they are, what gender they are, um, you know, it's, it can be um, new for people and it can be alarming, but I promise you that people can rise above what are their initial bias reactions if you give them the opportunity to do so. And I think that Rabbi Natasha can speak to that um, even more than I can, because I was fortunate to come into the rabbinate in the US after women were already starting to be um, taking on positions of leadership, while Rabbi Natasha is amongst one of the first uh, full-time pulpit rabbis who's a woman in, uh, in all of Europe, much less in the, in the UK, uh, certainly in the UK, in many parts of Europe as well. And so, I, um, and there are exercises you can also do to help people overcome bias that I'd be happy to speak about as well. But I'm gonna um, stop because we really wanted to have this session be a conversation and wanna open it up to all of you to ask what specific questions might be important for you. And thank you so much for that, Rabbi Parrott. That was really um, helpful to hear you uh, lay that out. Um, you just reminded me at the end when you were when you were saying about the the people overcoming biases question of um, my interview weekend uh, when I was at the small synagogue. I went to both of the synagogues that I now work for, and um, I won't name any names. But a couple came up to me after the service, and I'd led the service, and I taught, and I did a few things, and they came and they came up to me and they said. We voted against the idea of having a female applicant for, um, to be our rabbi, but we hope it's you. <laughs> <laughs> I think that really, that really highlights that, that it can be, you know, what you, yeah. what you think you want and what it turns out you want when they're in front of you can be very different things. Correct. And I have lots of stories of that from my own career, unfortunately. <laughs> Um, we have some questions that have come up in the chat that I want to make sure that we get to. Um, I want to start out with Rabbi Nitsan's question. Um, she asked about um, how can we build up rabbinical jobs and communities in continental Europe? I realize neither of you are um, in continental Europe, but if you have any thoughts about that, that would be great. I mean, I, I can say, first of all, I appreciate the irony. We're, we've just done Brexit and we're about to leave the EU. And I think I'm less qualified than ever before as a result of that to talk about it. Um, but it seems to me that a similar strategy than one to the one we've used in the UK could be appropriate across Europe. I think the most the best person to address that would be Rabbi Chaim, actually, because um, he's got he's actually got the knowledge of the communities across Europe and how they might be able to work together. There are obviously some complications like geography and language which we don't face in the UK to quite the same extent, but it seems to me that those could be um, surmountable. And, and I think it's a really good idea for communities across Europe to look into collaborating with each other around rabbinic recruitment. I just add that I think uh, it's probably in partnership between um, Rabbi Chaim and um, Rabbi Maurizio Balter um, from Asirti Olami and that there is probably some uh, coordination that needs to happen uh, there as well. Great, thank you. Um, the next question that I have is specifically um, for Matt, although Rabbi Parrots, if you want to add thoughts, you always can. Um, Ruti Amal um, asks, 
um, will we have enough full-time jobs in the Mithilti communities and movement in the UK for all the students? Do we plan to work with communities in other countries? And I'm not going to answer this, but I just want to say, like, what a good problem, right? So many potential rabbis that we have to ask a question like this. Matt. Um, so hi Ruthie, nice to see you. I haven't, all these people who live very close to me and I never get to see at the moment. Um, so uh, I think that's a really good question. Uh, my, my, I, I always remember Ben Gurion's famous statement from, from, the, from the Second World War that we must fight the white paper as if, there, as if there's no war and fight, and fight the war as if there's no white paper. I don't know if people remember that, that piece of history. Um, in other words, we've got two challenges and we have to address ourselves to both of them at the same time. So my, our version of that is we must build communities as if there are rabbis to lead them and we must train rabbis as if there are communities to employ them. And so far it's worked out that we've increased the number of rabbis and we've grown our communities roughly in parallel so that the numbers match up and we get a, a, an overall lift effect. It's a, it is a gamble and it's an act of faith um, to some extent and we may find that we end up with you know, a surplus of rabbis, but I think a surplus of rabbis is better than the other way around because we will find things for them to do. The question is just to find the money to employ them, but there was work for them. So finding money is easier than making rabbis, I, I think. Um, the, the other thing to add, I mean, I think Ruti's question implies the possibility of if there is a, a surplus of rabbis that we've managed to train in the UK or via the UK, are they available? Will they be available to European communities? And I think the answer to that should be yes. Um, so at the moment, we, you know, any rabbi that we fund, any student that we fund, we we oblige, we obligate them contractually to work for the movement for as many years as they receive funding. Now, if a job if a job isn't available in the UK movement, um, I would be. I mean, this is a policy decision we'd have to take. It's not up to me by myself, but. I would be amenable to allowing students, if there aren't jobs in the UK, to work off the obligation in other majority communities in Europe. I think that would be a really good idea. And we should certainly think about it, especially if those students have the correct uh, linguistic skills. I think that would be a really good idea to look into. I just want to add one other thing, if I could, and I don't pretend to know all of the um, uh, mechanics around the um, UK's scholarship program. But I do know that um, people often first associate rabbis with um, synagogues. And um, the truth is that worldwide in the rabbinical assembly, only about 60% of the rabbis work in synagogues. The other 40% do a variety of different things in schools, hospitals, camps, communal only organizations. The worldwide rabbis work in synagogues. 60%, correct. And in the conservative movement. And I tell you that because I hope that as a movement, we all agree that there is great, obviously we want our congregations to be served, but there's also great value in our um, message of a Judaism that is alive and vibrant and progressive and responding to today, that that's a value of having rabbis in all different kinds of uh, environments to share that message. And so, um, and I think by default, uh, Masorti UK is doing that by having some people do Noam and some people do um, other organizational stuff. But that's something that we should keep in mind as we think about the, the funnel. I know there was a rabbi in, um, in Germany, and I'll just end with this, who was, who was looking at starting um, chaplaincy, hospital chaplaincy, and being one of the first rabbis to actually um, be uh, introducing spiritual care in hospitals and nursing homes. What an amazing uh, way to serve the Jewish people. Wonderful, thank you. Um, I have a question here from Rabbi Rambaum. For our European colleagues, how can we work around the entrenched Orthodox establishments in many European countries who are antagonistic to us? Who wants to take that? Is, is that for one of us? I, 
Um, I, think, I think I think so. Yes. I have, you know, I mean, I think that's a that's very that's that's obviously a question about kind of a viewpoint rather than. A, but I, I can share our experience in the UK. I think so. In the UK, people might know that the majority of the majority of UK Jews belong to synagogues. I think about two thirds, and the major, and about seventy percent of them belong to Orthodox synagogues. So we do we have an Orthodox, and and most of them are not observant. So we have a very typical kind of orthodox establishment which most people belong to whether or not they're actually orthodox themselves and in the early days of the movement in the UK so I'm, I'm thinking back to the late eight well I don't exactly remember back that far I wasn't involved but thinking back to the, eight, the late 80s and then in particular in the 90s we faced lots of hostility from orthodox uh, from the orthodox establishment here and they did their best to shut us down and stop us from operating and put obstacles in our way and at the same time, we were, I think the mentality of our movement at that time was to constantly kind of look over our shoulders at the Orthodox and look for their approval and to try and kind of hope that one day we would be acceptable to them. And I think that the secret of our success, such as it's been, has been to stop doing that. And I think in recent years, I would say over the last 15 years or so, at least, we've shaken ourselves free of any attempt to get gain the approval of the Orthodox. We've stopped worrying about it. We do what we want. We're confident in our own uh, in our own Jewish identity. Um, we accept that the Orthodox establishment is not going to welcome us. We have actually very cordial relationships with the leadership of the Orthodox movements in, in the UK, but behind the scenes, um, and it's very clear that we compete with them. You know, they we we all get we're competitors in a marketplace. We're trying to get members. They're trying to get members. It's all above board, and that's and that's absolutely fine. Um, and we've seen that as in, by doing that, we've been able to grow. And the more we grow, the less we care about what they think about us. So that, that, that's just sharing our experience here in the UK. And, and I appreciate that in some other countries, it's harder because the cross-communal organizations are also orthodox. And what's been helpful for us in the UK is that the cross-communal organizations have been pluralistic. So uh, the Board of Deputies of British Jews, for example, and the Jewish Leadership Council have always had representatives from all of the synagogue movements. Um, and that's been helpful to us. And, you know, I would suggest that maybe in some of the other countries, if there's a need for more kind of political work, it should be on the cross communal organizations rather than trying to get orthodox religious organizations approval, which I think is probably a, non a non-starter. But I, I appreciate that I'm largely ignorant of the details of those arrangements in individual European countries. So I'll leave it at that. Right, Paris, did you want to add anything to that? Um, I just want to say that what I heard really just one, I mean, not that e everything you just said, Matt, was really important, but it really boiled down to one sentence for me, which is that the best recipe for that is to invest in ourselves. Hmm. And when we invest in ourselves, we're the, and the success will speak for itself, and it doesn't have to be a competition. So um, that's what I took out of what he was saying. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, I have... I think one last question, um, which is about shifting demographics. Um, this is a question from me, by the way, if that isn't clear. Um, the, best um, kind of, the best kind of question. <laughs> I've been thinking, um, you know, especially as you were telling the story of some of my colleagues coming through about how the demographics of the group of rabbis in Britain right now is not necessarily the exact same as the demographics um, were even just five years ago, let alone before that. And you can you can really see the the younger rabbis coming through. We're younger, that's how time works. Um, but also we have um, you know, more women. Um, I think that I'm the, I might be wrong about this, but I think that I'm the first person of color in the Masorti rabbinate. Um, we have, I, I might be wrong, but I'm the first one that I can think of at least. Um, and yeah, that um, we have more people from the LGBTQ community than before. And I'm wondering about how um, all of this is played out in the process of recruitment. Um, I think that I, I think that the the question of um, of gender is obvious because it's so clear in um, 
you know, when someone walks into a room and the, the new rabbi walks into the room, I'm thinking of the beginning of the Vicar of Dibley, that might go over your head, Rabbi Perrin, sorry about that. But, you know, the new vicar walks into the room and you can't help but notice. Um, and But I think also among all of the other demographic questions, how is this played into the recruitment process and how is it still playing into the recruitment process in the US, even uh, generation after some of these things were new? So I'm happy to take that one first. Um, so, and I appreciate the question. Um, and I have to say that I think that our, um, our schools, and this is worldwide in my experience, our schools are often ahead of some of our communities in this area. So our rabbinical schools almost across, I, I can't speak as much for um, South America because I haven't uh, had as much connection with their school. And then Israel tends to be for native Israelis, but certainly the other movement schools um, all have open admission to regardless of age, sex or gender identity, um, regardless of whether you're a Jew by choice or a Jew by birth, um, what color you are, what nationality, um, obviously you have to be halachically Jewish, which means you have to either have been born a to, to, to a Jewish mother or have gone through a halachic conversion process. Um, but, um, but there's, it, it's just not, um, it, it's not a, um, it's not a consideration in the application process. Um, and at the same time, uh, that ties into that question of bias that I was talking about, because I think that what I hear from rabbis who are in different categories at risk is that they continue to feel like there is um, bias. And so for me, what I do here in America, and I would be happy to think about how it culturally um, translates, is I do a lot of overcoming bias training for search committees, for boards of synagogues, for individuals in community. In fact, through the, um, through the wonderful leadership of the Women's League, and I think Debbie Kaner Goldich is on this call. She's the president of Worldwide Women's League. Um, and I see Barbara Ezring, also the chair of Torah Fund. Not only do they support the rabbinical schools in general and their funding, I should have mentioned that earlier when I was talking about the way funding helps international students as well as domestic US students, but they've also helped us establish a uh, institute for over overcoming gender bias and harassment here at Ziegler to help us um, work in partnership with other organizations to help make a difference not only in our school, but in the communities and to change culture. Thank you. Well, the, the only thing to add really quickly is that um, we've, we've gone in the UK from being a largely non-egalitarian movement to being a largely egalitarian movement quite quickly. Um, you know, that, that tip, we, re, we, we kind of went over that tipping point quite fast, I would say. Like when I started being involved in the movement, it was entirely non-egalitarian and now, I think there's there are two one community left which has a non-egalitarian minyan and another one which is Torah egalitarian and apart from that we're all egal. Um, and the issue of the issue of the issue of um, uh, sorry some, I have something going on in the room which was distracting me. I apologise. Mm -hmm. um, the issue of I think the issue of rabbinic leadership and gender specifically was one of the hardest kind of nuts to crack around egalitarianism because people had a very strong emotional connection to a rabbi being a man, um, and the and the you know I I took that uh, I took eroding that as a personal project actually, and I think the movement has been very proactive in trying to resolve that, partly by being opportunistic and employing women as rabbis whenever we got a chance, and just having them there and letting people see that such a thing exists, and gradually make you know people see something a few times and gradually they get used to it, and I think that Natasha, your story before was great that they said. Uh, you know, we didn't want a woman as a rabbi, but we hope it's you. That's exactly the model. That's exactly the strategy that we've employed. It's not about women, it's about a, an individual. And all of a sudden the, the resistance reduces. And I think we now have more work. And, and, and obviously, like you said, gender has been the main issue that we've worked on around that. And we are now in a place actually that most of our communities do accept women as rabbis and the movement accept, and, and everyone accepts that the movement will have women as rabbis. So I think that's been 
reasonably successful. Um, and I think we do have to move on to other topics such as the LGBT inclusion. Um, I think that's probably the next uh, thing we need to grasp. We've made some progress on that, but we need to do more work. But I do agree that you know, on areas of inclusion and equality, I think there is some room for top-down um, action, actually. And, it, and it, uh, in that level, the, the movement in whatever, whatever that means, so in the UK that meant misogyny Judaism, across Europe, there's a question as to what the movement means exactly. Um, but I think the movement can play a role in influencing the communities because, as, as you said, uh, Rabbi Cheryl, I think that uh, it, it's true that the leadership, you know, the rabbis or the rabbinic training schools are often ahead of the communities on those issues. And as a movement, we, I think we can play a role in, in making our movement a more egalitarian, more inclusive um, place. Yeah, I just I want to just uh, I know we have to end because I know I have to get on the, the call to be part of the ordination as well. But I wanted to just say um, two quick things to what Matt just said. The first, Matt, is that if our institute can help you um, in thinking about the UK and how to advance to the next issue of gender, um, I'm happy to talk to you. <laughs> um, but the second thing that I wanted to just say is just to point out like nuance, because this is such a fascinating thing, right? When I go to Europe, and people are talking to rabbis, it's always either first name in general or rabbi first name, men and women, no difference. In the US, when most um, often, when people uh, talk to a male rabbi, in public at least, they'll refer to them as rabbi last name and, um, and often refer to the women as rabbi first name. And therein you see some of the bias that already happens um, that we have to over, still have to overcome in this country. And it's just a really fascinating, um, you know, nuanced difference that I know now, because I've been in Europe enough, not to take that as, a, as, a, as an element that somebody's somehow um, demoting me or, or, you know, denouncing my rabbit. <laughs> Um, we do need to go now. I could listen to the two of you talk for another hour, but it turns out we have somewhere else to be. Um, if you are um, uh, joining us online at the ordination, um, you can find that in, in the chat. Um, I think that Tahila just put it in the yep. chat, starting very soon, the ordination mm -hmm. of Jacobina mm -hmm. and the Tanel Olhuft. Um, it has been such a pleasure, Rabbi Perret, it's been such a pleasure, Matt, hearing from both of you. Um, I feel like I got a little peek into a lot of what was happening in the last few years of my own life from a very different perspective. And that was very interesting for me and I'm sure for everyone else. Thank you all so much for coming and learning with us today. It's been a pleasure and um, Mazal Tov to anyone who's related in some way to the young men becoming young rabbis very soon. Um, yeah. Thank you all. Thank, thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rabbi Natasha. Thanks, nice Rabbi. to see everybody.